Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. On behalf of the Environmental Finance Center Network, I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, Consider Regionalization for Small System Sustainability. My name is Tess Clark. I work here at the Syracuse University Environmental Finance Center. Before we get started, I am just going to go over some information about our network and our Smart Management for Small Water Systems project. I also want to mention that this webinar is one of a series we are doing with the Connecticut Department of Public Health Drinking Water section, and make sure you check out the other webinars on our website and stay tuned for our last webinar on pressure tanks scheduled for February 13th. So first, a few things to know about the logistics for today. Everyone will be on mute to ensure audio quality. We love getting questions, so if you have a question, just type it into the GoToWebinar question dialog box at any time. We will be saving time for a Q&A session at the end of the presentation, but we'll be saving all the questions until then. If you are having technological difficulties, feel free to also use that question box and I will do my best to help you. We will post a video of this webinar and the slides on our website. You can reach that website at www.efcnetwork.org. Please allow two weeks for the processing and posting of these materials. Here's a map of our attendees today uh, from across the state of Connecticut and also from a few other states as well, so welcome. This webinar has not been submitted to licensing agencies for pre-approval of continuing education credits. However, we will provide a certificate of attendance for your personal records. You will need to check with your licensing agency directly if you are interested in receiving educational credit. You must attend the entire 60-minute session by logging into GoToWebinar with your unique registration link in order to receive a certificate. And we will be emailing the certificates within 30 days of the webinar. This session is one of several webinars that we conduct at the Environmental Finance Center Network for our Smart Management for Small Water Systems project. The EFCM provides training and technical assistance to small public systems in all 50 states and five territories to help local systems achieve and maintain compliance with the Safe Drinking Water Act. Here you can kind of take a look at our small systems team. Our network is national and we have centers in most US regions. Here you can take a look at our different uh, areas of expertise. We provide workshops, trainings, and direct assistance on the variety of topics you can see here. That includes things like water conservation, asset management, and things like regionalization, which you will hear about today. We also have a small systems blog. Our blog posts feature lessons learned from our trainings and technical assistance, as well as some, uh, some descriptions of available tools and some success stories. We also have a uh, resource that I'd like to point out to you before we really get going, and that is our online funding sources map. This is a tool that can help you find the major sources of funding for drinking water infrastructure projects for each state and territory. This is how you access those tables. On the EFCN homepage, go to the Resources tab and then click Funding Sources by State. This is going to take you to the map of the country. If you click on the state that you're interested in, you will find a PDF table of the relevant funding sources for drinking water infrastructure for that state. The table looks like the image on the left of the slide. For each funding program, it includes the name, a short description, and some contact information for someone that you can reach out to. Uh, and before I turn our presentation over to our experts for today, I have a couple of polling questions just to get the ball rolling. So the first question is, what kind of water or sewer utility do you operate? So just tell us if you're a for-profit system, local government, a not-for-profit or a cooperative, or a different system like an authority, a district, or a school. So I'm just going to give you three more seconds to put that response in, and then I'll go ahead and share the results with you all. Two and one. All right. And hopefully you can all see those results, but it looks like the majority today are not systems. However, we do have a strong showing from our not-for-profit systems as well with 21%. That's great. Thanks for joining us today. And then secondly, this is a question about what size water or sewer system you operate. So go ahead and tell us if you're small, um, you know, 500 or fewer or less, or very small, oh, I'm sorry, switch those, small, very small, medium, large or very large. And if you're not a water system, please let us know that as well. So I'm just going to give you uh, three more seconds to put that response in, and then I'll go ahead and share those results. It's a great way for us to see who's sort of virtually in the room. Okay, great. So 
we are seeing a lot of very small systems that are systems today. So welcome. I hope this information is valuable to you. All right. On that note, I would like to hand things over to our first presenter, Tom Roberts. Tom is the Community Assistance Manager at the UNC Chapel Hill Environmental Science Center. And Tom, I'm going to be getting the, you should be seeing the uh, screen share shortly. Okay, so uh, thank you, Tess. And thank you, everybody, for joining today. You should see my screen, Small Water System Partnerships and Regionalization Considerations. Again, my name is Tom Roberts, and I'm in Chapel Hill at the University of North Carolina. Uh, and primarily what I work on is small systems across the nation, um, doing um, outreach and helping them uh, mostly with financial issues uh, here out of the uh, University of North Carolina. Um, and then we share our resources with the others on the EFCN. Just a little bit about my background. I spent 35 and a half years in the utility business, mostly large systems. Um, the last nine or so, I was responsible for about 750 systems across North Carolina, water systems, and about 65 wastewater systems. And most of those were small, and some of them were very small. I had couple systems that were single digits. So um, I've sort of seen both both sides of the equation. The other thing I want to do is I want to thank the Connecticut Department of Health for putting on, for reaching out to us and, and working with us to put these uh, webinars on. I think they're very beneficial for everybody on the, um, on the call here today. Okay, so um, I want to talk a little bit about session objectives. And so today we're going to talk about partnerships and regionalization primarily. And um, we're going to we're going to talk we're going to start with talking about what it means to be sustainable as a water system. And I'm going to talk primarily about water systems because that's who I think I have on the on the call here today. But it actually would uh, apply a lot of this would apply the small wastewater systems too. So um, don't don't feel lost if you're a wastewater system and you happen to have dialed into this call. It, a lot of this applies to you too. So we're going to talk about system sustainability uh, and what that means to you. And then I'm going to talk some about the spectrum of partnership op options that are available. And um, I, you'll hear me say this more more than once, but uh, not one not one fits everybody. Um, everybody is a little bit different, so um, you can take what I say and you can take pieces of it and kind of run with that. And some of them might apply to you and some of them might not. And then we're going to talk a little, then we're going to talk quite a bit about regionalization and its potential benefits to small system sustainability. So again, what is system sustainability? That term sustainability gets used a lot. Um, these days, uh, especially from an environmental perspective, but we're going to talk a lot about managerial, managerial, technical, and financial sustainability. We'll dive into these all a little bit uh, deeper, but from an overview perspective, managerial is what it sounds like, right? It's an engaged governance and operational management. And, and uh, I put a succession plan there, too, and a lot of people sort of forget about that, but it's a big topic with our, within our industry as, um, as people sort of age out of their roles within a utility or within a, an operation or with, even within governance. Um, I think it's important to have that. The other, the other thing is, is that I know we've got a lot of small systems and probably HOA systems, and I don't currently live in an HOA uh, uh, community, but I have lived in an HOA community, and I understand the, the governance which is out. So I think succession planning is part of the managerial sustainability that people sometimes forget about. Um, technical sustainability, uh, we, we talk about the regulations and, um, you know, I've, I've, I've been in this business a long time. The regulations changed a lot over my, my career 
and continue to change. So understanding what's current, and then I think being able to understand and, and adapt to future regulations. Most regulations have a lead time, so you know they're coming. So you need to be able to adapt to those uh, regulations. And then we'll talk a bunch about financial sustainability. And uh, you know it's pretty simple to say that your rates need to provide enough funding to cover your regular day-to-day O&M, but it also needs to uh, cover your, your capital investments, your capital expenses. And uh, I know that we've had other webinars on asset planning and, and, uh, and management. And so um, you need, when we talk to people about rates, especially small systems, we talk about developing a, a capital improvement plan or an asset management plan that might last five to 20 years, depending on you know the age of your system and sort of the vision that you're looking for but at least be able to cover your, your current capital needs. And of course, any of us that have been in the industry understand that what you plan for today changes tomorrow because uh, nobody plans for a main break or a coronator to, to die or something like that. So having that, that financial sustainability is an important piece of, uh, of the conversation. So that's really what we're talking about when we talk about sustainability. So let's talk about let's talk a, a bunch about uh, partnerships and um, why they're of value to small small systems, especially um, big systems um, also, but especially to small systems. Uh, and then um, you know how does it all start? And I'm gonna, I'll, I'll start by saying that it all starts with reaching out and open communication with potential partners. And we're going to talk about who those potential partners might be, but it, um, really, uh, you know, your neighbor, uh, the community down the street, government entity, um, a, a large water purveyor, um, just picking up the phone and, and, and talking to those people is the starting point of all that. The other term we talk, we, we kind of kick around a bunch in this in this uh, conversation is capacity development, and uh, and that's really the process that part of the process of what you're here to, today to learn about and, and that's to acquire and maintain that technical managerial financial capacity and um, you know if, if you keep those three components in mind it really uh, leads you to the end goal which is providing that safe drinking water to the, the people you're serving um, and so You'll, you'll hear us talk a lot about uh, technical, managerial, and financial capacity, and um, you'll see that on a bunch of our slides. I took this this slide, the, the three circles, um, from the Connecticut State Department of Public Health Capacity Development website, and it really demonstrates how the three components sort of interact with each other. And so we've talked a little bit about uh, how that all works. Um, but you can see a little bit more um, some of the components. So, for example, uh, ownership accountability. Um, I think it's important to have ownership that's engaged, whether that's HOA or governing board or elected officials, whatever it may be. Um, you know, a utility sort of doesn't work on autopilot real well. Uh, it will, it will, um, it, you will find the weak points pretty quickly. So. Uh, having a, an engaged ownership is important. Staffing properly, like any business, is important. And then having those external linkage, and we'll talk a little bit towards the end about um, the, uh, the role of the regulators when it comes to regionalization and collaboration and partnerships. Um, technical capacity sort of is, feels almost self-evident, right? You need to understand how the business, how the technical side of the business works, but you need to have, you know, source water adequacy. Uh, and when I think of that, I think of quantity and quality, right? Um, you need to have enough and it needs to be of enough, of good enough quality that you can treat it and deliver it to your customers, knowing that you're providing them uh, good, good uh, drinking water. Um, but it doesn't just start and end with the with the source water, it's also the infrastructure that goes along with it. With it, so it's source, the treatment, the 
distribution and the storage. So sort of beginning to end. And, 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 and sometimes um, the, the pipe network, the distribution kind of gets forgotten because it's underground and people don't really see it until you're digging it up at Christmas morning because you have a main break. Um, but I think it's important to keep them all in mind. And then implementation of that technical knowledge. It's great to have all that, that good technical knowledge, but you need to be able to uh, implement it. And then financial capacity, uh, revenue sufficiency. Um, if you go to uh, the EFCN network, or if you're one of our small systems clients, the first thing we will do, we'll do, we'll do a uh, financial health checkup. So we'll take your revenue and your expenses and, and put them in a tool that we have, and we'll look to see if you're covering your your day-to-day -day expenses. And we'll look at it both with and without depreciation. So depreciation being sort of a, a proxy for capital needs, um, and we'll we'll talk you through that. But revenue sufficiency is important. Credit worthiness, if you're going to the credit market, whether it's the state revolving fund or other credit uh, uh, sources, you need to have credit worthiness. Um, this is a high capitalization business. Um, you're going to spend money over the life of the system. Um, you know, just putting money back into pipe or whatever it might be. So you need to have that credit worthiness to be able to, uh, to, to, to reach out and get that money. And then fiscal management and controls, again, feels a little bit self-evident, but, uh, you know, controls in, you know, on, on how you spend your money and what you spend it on, good budgeting, uh, and then, you know, the, the fiscal uh, management as far as, uh, and controls as far as making sure that you, um, you know, you're spending the money in the right places and that you don't have sort of any holes in the checks and balances. So. This is a great slide. I encourage you to go to the capacity development website and take a look at it and uh, share it with others within your organization. I think it kind of tells the whole story when it comes to sustainability. And so, um, you know, they all kind of link together and and become part of the short and long-term plan of a good, sustainable, viable utility. So, uh, again, kind of reiterate the same kind of thing. Um, this talks about technical uh, capabilities. Uh, we, we talked about that on the previous slide. Um, and then uh, managerial capabilities. And one of the things we do when, when we're talking to small systems is that we usually talk with the operators, right, the people that are making the day-to-day the -day stuff go on. But eventually, we're going to talk to the uh, governing body, whether, again, it's elected officials, HOA, uh, whatever it might be. And I think it's important um, sometimes for them to hear from a, a third party that, um, you know, they, with their responsibility as being on the governing board, well, however that is defined, comes with some accountability of ownership, and a pretty high level accountability of ownership. Um, in my previous role, uh, outside of the EFC, we used to remind people that we are the only utility, the water systems are the only utility that customers ingest our product. And so it's a, when you put it, kind of frame it in that mind, um, there's a lot of accountability and responsibility that goes with that. And so uh, we like to talk to the managerial people about that and make sure they, they understand sort of their role when it comes to water system capabilities. And then financial, again, we talked about these same things. Um, a lot of people uh, get caught up in the revenue piece of it, which is very important, right? Setting rates on your, whether it's your neighbors or your the people that elected you or whoever it is, it's never a fun thing to go to them and say, hey, we've got to change rates um, because, you know, we, we we're looking to the future, or you know, we're just not covered. You know, the electric went up, or the chemicals price went up, or whatever the case may be. But it's real important to have that revenue stream coming in to cover the O and M. Again, um, pretty evident, but you know, if 
people struggle with that discussion, and um, we have some really great race tools that can help you make that discussion. The other thing, and I really don't talk about that much within this uh, presentation, is um, communicating with, with your customers. And so it goes back to the managerial uh, and piece of it. You know, your customers, if they only hear from you when you've got to go change their rates, they're not hearing from you enough. They need to understand, uh, you know, our pipe was put in 25 years ago. It's got a life of 50 years. We can't wait. We need to start replacing or we need to start saving or we need to go talk to the credit market or whatever the case may be. That communication as a manager is key, right? Get out there and make sure that, that your people understand. And I understand if you're a, an HOA, sometimes it's um, a little bit like pulling teeth to get people to be engaged with HOA decisions until until there's a, a crisis or until there's a change to their pocketbook. But it really is important that they um, that your clients, um, your customers, your residents, your neighbors understand why what's going on with their water system. And then. The other thing is, is that for revenue, especially, it's important to think about not just today, but look to the future, right? So you, your customers are going to be there forever, um, and so you need to be thinking into the future. So that might include, I know in the state I'm in, in North Carolina, and sort of across the industry, that includes a declining demand. We're seeing that across a lot of uh, at, you know, clients that we talk to. So declining demand, if you're counting on a certain revenue stream, might be an issue you have to deal with. Um, big capital investments coming or saving for those capital investments are, are an important piece of looking to the future. And then just funding reserves, and there's lots of discussion about, you know, reserves. And notice I didn't say capital reserves necessarily. Um, we've, we've had some clients that actually save and so if they've got a, a wet summer and they don't see the revenue that they expected, they can kind of live off those reserves, not live off completely, but live off a piece of the reserves to sort of flatten out the impact to their customers. And so they're all important pieces of, of the financial capabilities and the financial sustainability. And of course, you put them all together and you got a sustainable utility. Um, they're, all, they're all tough to manage on their own, but uh, you know, I think it's important that we kind of put them all together and look at them as a whole. So we're going to talk a little bit about partnerships, and um, we've got a bunch of poll questions in here that we may or may not go through depending on uh, time, and we may skip over some, but we're going to talk about partnerships, and these range from, um, you know, loose, less formal arrangements to real formal arrangements, but really any collaboration between systems can be helpful. Um, it's, a, it's an interesting business in that, um, you know, as you, as systems get bigger, they, they tend to, um, can work more efficiently. Um, so in this business, you know, the, the size of the system uh, is, is, can be a hindrance. If you're small, you know, you're not, um, you don't have the purchasing power. You don't have a lot of things, you know, that are that are hard to deal with. But um, so any kind of collaboration can be helpful, and and, and so we're going to talk a little bit about that. So we're going to talk. I'm going to run through some examples. And again, what I said in the beginning is is that, for example, information sharing that might be the starting point of a whole collaboration. And maybe that's all you ever do, but at least it's something. Um, and it might be a piece of something that you want to do, and you'll see something later in the uh, partnership discussion that, that, is, that is more uh, more structured to what you want to do. So information sharing is just that, right? Pick up the phone, call your the neighboring um, town, or you know, or talk talk to the neighboring uh, HOA. Say hey, you know, let's let's get together over coffee and, and uh, talk about uh, infrastructure. I know, real exciting stuff, right? I've been doing it uh, a long time, right? 35, 30, 37 years, 
but it, it's real important to have that conversation. And so I, I would strongly encourage you that if you're not doing this, that you should be doing it, um, you know, you should be doing it no matter what. Um, it doesn't cost you anything. It might cost you a cup of coffee or, or whatever, but, uh, you know, get, getting together with your neighbor and finding out what's going on I think is important. So I think, Tess, on this one we will do the polling question. Is that good for you? Absolutely. I've got it up right now. Okay, so we're going to, we're asking you, are you doing information sharing? If you're not, but you'd like to explore more, and no, that's not something we're really interested in. So we're going to, we're going to roll through this polling question pretty quick. So Tess, you want to, I guess, close it and let's see what we got? Yep. Um, I can tell you we have 45% of, of the attendees today arguing them, 36% are not, and only 18% are not interested. I'm going to go ahead and close that for now. Okay, Tom? Good deal. So it's great that um, some of you, good portion of you are doing it, and uh, I think, I think um, it's beneficial, and I would encourage you to do it more. If you're in that 36 that says you're not, but you'd like to explore them more, it's, this is not rocket science, right? So it's, it's pick up the phone, call the neighboring utility, or when you next see your, uh, you know, your Department of Health inspector or you're talking to a regulator, say, hey, I'd like to talk to some people in, my, in, in the general area about infrastructure. Can you give me some names? They'd be happy to do that. And then thirdly, this is a super transparent business. You can go on, there's plenty of websites that can give you names of, of utilities in, um, in the area. Now, it doesn't give you maybe a really good contact, um, but you can go on, uh, uh, EPA's got some websites. I'm sure the state of Connecticut's got some websites. But I would encourage you to do that. And, that, and then you 18% that are not interested in this model, I'm assuming you're not in the utility business. And so uh, let, let's hope that's what it is. But if, if uh, it doesn't really hurt to pick up the phone and, and call your neighbor. So let's talk about another partnership and let's talk a little bit about a buying consortium. And so I talked I talk some about how small systems um, are sort of at a disadvantage, right? You're, you, you don't have that economies of scale to go, you can go to your um, local waterworks supply house and say, Give me your best price on a, you know, a, a couple sticks of pipe or something like that. You, you just you're going to pay retail for whatever it is. But if you go if if you get together with some other communities and you all kind of commit to uh, dealing with the same supply house um, and say, look, at, we're going to come in and maybe we'll buy, we'll we'll, we'll uh, encourage our partnership to come do that. Um, the, that supply house might cut you a break on uh, pricing. The other thing to talk about, to think about, is um, it's also if you're buying equipment or chemicals. Uh, I guarantee if you're feeding uh, 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 chlorine at, at your uh, liquid chlorine in, in your facility, the neighbor down the street is, and the neighbor down the street is, and the neighbor down the street is. Um, you might be able to talk to your chemicals, and you might be using four different chemical suppliers. You might be able to talk to your chemical supplier and say, look, at, if we can get, you know, the six of us together and say, we're going to buy our chlorine from you uh, this year, what's the best price you can get? I can tell you from experience that chemicals, the chemical piece of that, there's a little bit of up and down in that, but it's the transportation cost that is, is, can, be, can really drive costs. And so if you can, if you can sort of, uh, you know, get everybody together, you can probably do some good there. And then just general supplies is another thing to think about. So it's something that you might want to think about uh, um, when you're talking to these people, you know, especially you 45% that are, that are having that conversation. And so I think we will do this polling question too, um, Tess. So again, we're asking on the buying consortium, and it doesn't have to be formal, right? It doesn't have to be real formal. Are you doing it today? Are you, are you not doing it, but it's something that interests you and you'd like to explore it more, or are you just not interested? So we'll go pretty quick on the poll. Uh, 
not doing them but are interested in starting. 33% and saying, hey, you know, we bought thousand dollars worth of chlorine last year. How about you? And who'd you buy it from? Maybe we can work together and kind of glom everybody together into a, a buying consortium. And it, it doesn't have to be formal. It doesn't have to be written on paper. It just has to be a commitment to the to the supplier and say, look, it, the six of us are going to buy. Would be interested in buying from you for next year. Just give us your best price and see how it goes. You can formalize that if you want, but there you certainly is not required to do that. So the other one is equipment sharing, um, and this is uh, this is you know again high capitalization business. So when we talk about equipment sharing, we talk about like a backhoe or a dump truck or a, a trench box or maybe leak detection equipment or um, even meter reading equipment. Um, you know, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense if there's a bunch of systems that are near each other. And I'll use meter reading equipment. If you're all using the same uh, equipment to read meters, why ha why have six different sets of that equipment when you could have one set and have an agreement that you share between the six? Now, you got to work out the details. Who's going to buy it initially? What if it breaks? That kind of stuff. But you can kind of share that burden across uh, the, the six systems probably needs to be. We move that up a little bit from the left. You know, our red dot is a little bit moved from left to right, so uh, um, it probably needs to be a little bit more formalized. Um, I think we'll I think we'll do this polling question, and I think we're going to skip a couple after this one. But let's go ahead and do this polling question on equipment sharing. So, are you doing it today? Um, it's some is it something you're interested in um, going forward? Um, or are you just not interested? You just don't think it's worthwhile to you. All right. It looks like we've got most people already responding. So I'm going to go ahead and close this for now, okay? And yeah. share the results. Looks like 36% uh, are not doing them but are interested in starting. 9% are actually already doing equipment sharing, but we do have about 55% that are not so sure they're interested. Yeah, I would say that this one it would be sort of the advanced partnership, right? Um, there's a bit of a trust factor when you're sharing equipment. You know, what if you need to read meters and the other person's reading meters? But I think it's something worthwhile. I, um, it's kind of cool that we've got 9% that are doing that. Um, so another thing, and this is, uh, although it shows uh, less formal, it's actually been formalized at the state level um, is mutual aid assistance. Um, sometimes it's very casual, right? I'm working with a system in Western North Carolina that is small and they have a neighbor who's large and they're two units of government. And when they run into a problem, it happens to be a wastewater system, but you can apply it to water. Um, uh, for example, they don't have their own jetting machine, so they call up to the big system and say, hey, you bring your jetter down, and they come down and they jet it out as a mutual aid. And it's sort of big brother taking care of little brother kind of thing. That's sort of the simplest way to think about it. And two small systems can do that kind of stuff a little bit, right? But the other thing is, is that in many states, and I've, Connecticut has this, um, there is a formalized system called a, a water warn um, and you can join that, um, and there's a website out there. It's uh, ctwarn.org, and you can you can look into that and see if that sort of fits your needs. And um, I can tell you that in North Carolina, that you know, um, last year we went through a couple big hurricanes, and that water warn was 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 critical to a lot of systems down here, sort of working together. You know, do you have a fitting that I don't have? I need some big pumps. Do I need? Can you? Do you have a generator I can share? That was huge. Um, so I think there's, I think there's real opportunity there for for both for all systems, right? Small or medium size. And so we're not going to take that full question. And then one of the one of the things um, partnership wise is emergency connection. Pretty straightforward thing, um, and it gives you some flexibility during emergencies. And so this one I do want to take the poll question on just to see.
see because we see that uh, a lot uh, when it comes to um, sort of giving reducing risk. And so you know, there's you go to uh, the FCN network uh, website. There's lots of resources on um, what to think about, like who invests in the in, in the uh, interconnection and that kind of thing. So um, go ahead, test. Awesome. Yep. So I've currently launched the poll. It looks like we've got almost everyone responding. I'm just going to go ahead and close it right about now. Okay. And then as for the results, 36% uh, of our attendees today are already participating in the emergency interconnection. 18% um, are not doing them, but, but they are interested in starting. And then 45% are still not super interested in doing it at this time. Got it. So, um, no, no surprise that 36% already have emergency in connections. That's a lot of what we see, and uh, both big, small, medium uh, systems do a, a lot of that kind of thing. So, um, I'm going to skip along because I want to talk about partnerships. Um, and I'm running a little bit. Short on time. So let's talk about regionalization. And if we have time, I'll go back to some of the other partnerships. And my whole PowerPoint is going to be posted um, so you'll be able to look at some of the other partnerships. But to give you an example, um, uh, one is operational collaboration, um, sort of sharing an operator kind of thing, uh, managerial co collaboration. Uh, think of satellite operations, and we're going to talk a little bit about that in regionalization um, as some shared managerial. Um, uh, there might be some shared O&M, and then it kind of leads its way into regionalization and, colla and um, colla more, more defined collaboration. Um, and so, and I use the term regionalization or collaboration partnerships, they all kind of uh, come from the same family. But when I think of regionalization, again, it's not just connecting pipes, right? It's connecting the other pieces of that, that model, the, um, the, whether it's managerial, technical, or financial. And so, uh, for example, I go back to my past, I, was, I, I happened to be a system aggregator, so there was a lot of opportunity to to, to uh, own and operate these small systems. And, but they were not anywhere interconnected. I had systems that were six hours apart from each other. So that was more of a managerial regionalization. And so we'll talk a little bit about that. And I want to touch a little bit, and I'm not the expert on, on uh, the uh, Connecticut State Water Plan, but in preparation for this, I actually uh, read a, a couple sections of it. And, and skim through the rest of it. And there's some, if you haven't read this, as a water operator, I encourage you to, uh, to, go, to go get it. Um, I think you can find it on the capacity development webpage, um, but you could certainly uh, go in and search in your favorite search engine under Connecticut State Water Plan and find it. It's a big, beautiful PDF document. It has a lot of good information. Um, there's, a, a, and uh, Eric, from the Department of Health is going to talk a little bit more later on. There's a lot of talk about the collaboration. But I pulled out a couple sections that I thought were important to sort of touch on. So the first section was about regionalization. And the state recognizes in the water plan that, um, you know, if municipalities, and you can plug in units of government, HOAs, whatever, work together uh, and, you know, they're looking for more collaboration between water systems and wastewater systems across the state. And the state is looking at how to encourage that, right? Um, not only is it hard to, as a regulator, to sort of manage all these systems, but you also have to, you know, you've got some that are just not sustainable. And so, um, again, Eric's going to talk about that later on. Um, the other one I pulled out was, um, 
discussion about interconnections. And so the plan encourages interconnections. I think it was real important that they also recognize that there has to be controls and considerations appropriate for the purpose of interconnections. And so uh, we kind of, I kind of jumped over that, but you know, there's discussion about rates, there's discussion about does it, does that interconnection work, you know, bi-directionally in both directions? Who makes the investment on the interconnection? Uh, who's responsible for meter calibration? So there's lots of discussion when it comes to when you start physically connecting pipes. And there's some technical discussions too, and your, your, your Department of Health, your state regulators can help you with that. Um, you know, if the water quality on one side, or the chemistry on one side is different than the other, one's hard, one's soft, one's this, one's that. You know, there's just has to be a discussion there. So, but I thought it was important that they they encouraged interconnections, um, and they don't, at least in this language, don't really call it out as emergency interconnections, just interconnections. And then um, the other thing I thought was interesting was there was a recognition uh, of barriers, right? Uh, and I, I would call them challenges, right? I'm an optimist, so I, I would change that to challenges to consolidation or regionalization. Cost is one of them. I think that's. I think there's ways of overcoming that. We've we've done some interesting things here in North Carolina when it comes to to, to the cost of uh, connecting systems and and doing that regionalization. Um, engineering considerations. We talked a little bit about the technical considerations. Uh, I'm going to skip over home rule for a minute, and then the opposition to large system, large system expansions and interconnections and customer preference. I sat on the other side of that, right? I was the large system, and um, I think it's important that you go into it with your eyes wide open and understand that, like with any relationship, there's pluses or minuses, pluses and, and trade-offs, and so um, I think you you need to you need to go into it um, with realistic expectations if you're going to talk to one of the large systems. And I'm going to I'm going to touch on um, I'm going to touch on uh, on that later on in the presentation a little bit. But I thought that was important. And then as far as the home rule is concerned, I'm not an expert. I'm not a lawyer. Um, I think that's something that you need to consider if you're a unit of government going forward. Again, I, I've got to expect that that's uh, Achievable, right? You, that you can kind of, you can kind of uh, overcome all these considerations if it makes the most sense for your system. And again, it goes back to that responsibility and accountability when it, when it comes to uh, uh, the governing board. And so, um, the one thing I would say is, is that if you're considering regionalization, um, there's really two what what we like to refer to as two flavors of. Uh, regionalization, and I'm going to start with regionalization light. And so that's sort of that partnership discussion that we had, maybe a technical uh, partnership, and the, maybe the systems, the individual systems retain their ability to set their own rates. We've seen that where they're just buying maybe bulk water from a, a neighboring system, but they retain the ability to set their own rates. The one consideration that, that, that or one thing we we recommend strongly when you're, if you're considering that sort of the re re regionalization light, and we understand why a lot of people sort of uh, dip their toes into regionalization by doing this is make sure you've got a path to sort of full regionalization, full consolidation, because sometimes if you get too far into the regionalization light, it just there's not enough uh, momentum to, to get the full regionalization or full consolidation. So it's something to consider. And then full regionalization is, is sort of that. And again, not one, sh not one size fits all, right? So there's light and there's full, but there's plenty of flavors in between that you can consider. But you know, full re regionalization is basically combined governance and oversight. Um, maybe a physical interconnection of systems. I know the state and the regulators and the operators would all like to have that, but there's lots of virtual interconnection, right, whether, whether it's managerial or expertise or labor or that kind of thing um, that is available. And then financial, 
and I think people lose track of this piece. Financial is a huge piece of this. It's a pooled asset. So you spread instead of spreading the risk over your small community, you're now spreading risk over a larger group of people, which means if you've got an issue in the future in the system, it gets spread over more rate payers. It's a huge thing, right? Think of it as insurance or uh, some other pooled risk. I think it's, I think, uh, you know, it, when, especially if you're talking about uniform rates, um, I think that's important. And no matter what, when you got regionalization, you probably should have a, if you're not going to have uniform rates in the beginning, you should, probably should have a path to uniform rates. So we've touched on most of these, and I'm going to sort of speed up a little bit so I leave enough time for Eric. And uh, again, um, think about these when you're thinking about regionalization in a small system, uh, sustainability. The growth tool we didn't really touch on, but even if you're an HOA that is, say, fully built out, you want, you know, the value of your house depends on that infrastructure. And so even if it's not growth, it's, uh, it's uh, you know, if somebody's going to come look in your neighborhood to buy a house and they see the infrastructure is kind of falling apart around it, you know, it's, a, uh, it's an economic development piece that you, you need to think about. Then again, we've talked about a lot of this future rate setting, uh, uh, there, a discussion about capital investment, establishment, about a dispute. You're going to have disputes post-regionalization. You probably should think about those when you're talking about regionalization. And then financial transparency, always key to, the, to making a, a system work, right? It's, it's a trust and communication thing uh, as much as anything. I'm going to just touch on this real quickly, and that's what about a private utility? And I put a link on here. If you go to um, the, my EFC, the UNC's EFC, um, you can find a webinar that actually I did on private water and sewer companies and what sort of drives them to why they're interested in acquiring systems and what they can be good for and what they can be not maybe as good for um, and sort of what the things to think about. The other thing is, is that uh, my contact information is at the front of this document in the back of this PowerPoint. Drop me an email, pick up the phone. Um, I can kind of give you the insight when it comes to dealing with large systems. I, I will, full disclosure, I did not work for any of the large systems in Connecticut, so I, I don't have any, I don't have any special insight, just I worked for one of the large systems. Um, and there's different things to talk about when you so let's talk just real quick about some of the additional challenges. Um, uh, you're going to recognize you're going to have opposition. That's just the way it's going to be. Don't oversell the benefits. I've seen that just blow up um, going into regionalization in partnerships, but especially regionalization. And then if you think that this is something you want to do, uh, I would encourage you to get a third party. I've actually been that for some regionalization efforts. It's I think it's good to sort of have a arbitrator, mediator, facilitator um, kind of thing. Um, talk to your, talk to others and see how they've done it. See what the good and the bad has been. Start communicating to your stakeholders, not just your rate payers, not just your homeowners. And then, of course, the devil's in the details. And then um, we're going to talk a little bit about the role of the regulators. Um, I think they have a big role in helping you through the process and identifying sort of the pitfalls along the way. Um, they can steer you to potential partners. They know some of the people that are having issues maybe the same as you are. And so I encourage you to talk to your regulators. Kind of leads me into, I'm going to pass the baton here in a minute to Eric McPhee from the Department of Public Health. He's going to talk a little bit about the water, util water utility coordinating committees in um, Connecticut. And then I'm just touched if you go to EPA, has some great resources on water system partnerships, and also the EFCM has some uh, uh, resources. And so that's my presentation. There's my contact information. Uh, I um, encourage you to reach out if you've got any questions. I know I've kind of sped up there towards the end, but um, feel free to reach out. Uh, we'd love to talk to you. So Tess, I'm, uh, I'm done with my piece. Great. 
Um, so next up is Eric McPhee. He's from the Connecticut Department of Public Health Drinking Water Section here to talk a little bit about this topic also. So Eric, you should be able to take it away. Okay, thanks Tess and Tom. Everything looks right and sounds right? Everything looks That's awesome. Good. Perfect. So the, the timing of this webcast is awesome because we're just wrapping up now. Tom touched on the state water plan and that was recently wrapped up and published. And we like to think about the state water plan as being all uses of water, but we also just finished, just published, just got approved something that's very specific to public water supplies. And that's our WOOCs. WOOCs are Water Utility Coordinating Committees. And we just in the past 24 months, developed these plans, they're now published and approved, and, and we're, we're moving towards implementation. But there's a number of things uh, that the WOOCs have done and continue to do related to capacity and related to um, regionalization. So I'm gonna do 21 slides in nine minutes and, and touch on and maybe just start the conversation for how the WOOCs could help the small uh, community public water supplies. We have in Connecticut, I know there's some out-of-state people that are on, which is awesome, uh, in Connecticut, there are about 330 small community systems, and certainly uh, us being the, the primacy agency for the Safe Drinking Water Act and, and regulating systems, we understand it is very, very difficult right now to be a small community system. So uh, the things that I'm going to talk about will start to maybe offer, a, start a conversation or, or give the small communities some tools. Um, I think most of the systems, if I remember from the poll, were, were, were under 500 and under 1,000, so, so that's great. Um, talk about some tools that they might be able to use to help them along from a capacity and regional, regionalization perspective. The WOOCs, as I said, are Water Utility Coordinating Committees. The official members of the WOOCs are Public Water Systems and the Councils of Government. Um, for most of the meetings and in the development of the plans, the state agencies, uh, the public, NGOs, uh, you know, anyone who wanted to go would take part. They would have opportunities to contribute to the conversations. And for, for two years, you know, we got together and put together, I'll skip a couple, put together these plans, which, like I said, are now published. They, they are voluminous. There's a lot of data there, but there is some really good information related to things that small community systems can do. The WOOCs, I'm going to go quickly through this, are a legislative idea. This was done some time ago. It is, uh, the intent is to maximize efficient and effective development of the state's public water supply systems and to promote public health, safety, and welfare. And our agency, the Department of Public Health, had to administer this procedure for the WOOCs. The WOOCs exist for smart planning for public water supply in Connecticut. We split the state after some research and, and thinking about it, we split the state into three WOOCs. There's a Western WOOC, a Central, and an Eastern. A lot of that has to do with just the ease of having people meet in a location that's not too far from their water system. So this, these are the three WOOCs. Plans were created for each of the three WOOCs. Um, and then we have some documents that sort of tie the three regions together. A big part of what the WOOCs did is come up with exclusive service areas. Each of these different colors that you see are a municipality or water system that has um, if there is a, a future expansion of water supply within an ESA, there is a responsible party that has to help administer and, and, and make sure that there is safe and adequate water provided to people that need it within the ESAs. Um, this mapping and, and the systems that have the ESAs are all included in the, in the published reports. So one of the chapters within the final coordinated plans is uh, specific to small systems challenges and viability. And so in working with the consultant that we had through the WOOCs, we looked at all 330 small community systems and assessed every single one of them. Um, so for those of you that are small systems that are, that are on this webcast, surprise, a lot of the information about you is, is published not only online, but in these reports. And that's not done to scare uh, systems uh, it's to just for informational purposes so that we can start to work regionally, so we can start to help you, and so we can start to have these systems work together and, and have viability moving forward. So what the WOOCs did was they categorized each system into, into one of four categories for them to achieve viability. And, and I don't know if this is hard for people to read if you have small screens, but I'll just read through the four categories. So thinking each small community public water system, if they want it to be viable, would fit into one 
one of one or more of four categories. And one would be conduct internal improvements and remain a small independently owned community water system. Two, pursue, acqu ugh, pursue acquisition by a larger community system and remain a satellite system owned and operated by the larger system. Three, interconnect with a larger or more viable community water supply. Or four, interconnect and eventual, eventually consolidate with a larger or more viable system. So for all 330 systems, this analysis was done and they were thrown into bins. Um, you could fit into one or more bins if there were one or more options available to you. Obviously, if you're 10 miles away from another water system, uh, pursuing an interconnection is not a viable option. So that analysis was done for all 330. And then for each of the three walks, there was this summary document that actually talked about each of the systems. Um, this is an example from the Western Walk where it talks about some systems in Brookfield and uh, where everyone fits in, this, in these regionalization options and interconnection options. Uh, surprise, the lists are all on the uh, website. They're all in the reports. So if, if you have a small system or you're interested in your neighboring small system uh, or, or whatever, all of the information is, is out there. So if you look, it may be hard to see, but the system and the town are listed in the left. The capacity scores, which I'm going to talk about in a second, are in the middle. That was an analysis that was done in 2015 as to each community system's technical managerial and financial capacity, as, as Tom described in his presentation, um, each system was assigned an overall score for capacity, and that tied into which of the four options each of these systems would fit in. So if you look in the right, part, right columns on this uh, slide, you'll see that you know, most systems, option A was you know, to, to develop their own capacity and viability was an option for all systems, and then some of the other categories fit as well. Most systems had one or at least one option available to them. So like I said, I have three minutes left. The, um, all of this information, all broken down by WOOC is available on our website. On the last slide, uh, the website information is there. Um, we encourage everyone to take a look. A lot of work went into this. Uh, systems were involved, local government was in involved, and it's all captured now in these documents. This is an example of some of the analysis that was done. This was taken from the central WOOC. This is a, a heat map of, of small community system densities, again, from a planning perspective and from a regional, regionalization perspective. Um, you know, it's important to take a look at where are these hotspots for um, a need for regionalization. And surprise, surprise, on this map, uh, East Hampton has this red hotspot. And, and for those of you that are in Connecticut, you may have seen on the news recently that there is a proposal to extend water uh, to East Hampton at the cost of $80 million um, in an effort to regionalize parts of central Connecticut based on an, an extreme need uh, in East Hampton for public water supply. We did some promotional documents with the WOOCs and uh, we came up with a top 10 needs for, for, for public water systems in Connecticut. You'll see with my uh, neatly crafted circle there that one of them is assistance to pub, pub, small public water systems. So we acknowledge um, that small public water systems need help. A lot of work within the WOOC went towards trying to give small systems tools to, to have capacity and to maintain themselves. Um, so uh, this doesn't, I, uh, this was geared obviously towards systems and giving tools to systems to help you along. But, um, you know, for small systems, do a little bit of research, look at your neighbors, look at yourself, look at the numbers we gave you and, and the analysis that was done. Um, hopefully it's reasonably accurate and, and it can be a conversation starter for us to work with you and for you to work with your neighbors and maybe for you to come to WOOC meetings and have a conversation there because we think that, you know, when, when Tom talked about talk to your neighbor in his presentation, I think the WOOC meetings, which are going to start to pick up steam again, uh, would be a perfect opportunity to have these conversations about where these small systems are and where they are compared to their neighbors and how um, you know, neighbor, neighboring systems can work together to, to make sure, maintain viability, viability and capacity. That is the uh, main website for the WOOCs. Like I said, all the reports and everything are on there. It's all available to everyone to download. I also did want to announce, and, and we saw this uh, little Venn diagram, is it a Venn diagram? Is that what they're called? Uh, earlier in, in Tom's presentation, but we just put up a, a, a DPH capacity website. It's up and running. Um, 
the you know a lot of the information that Tom talked about and, and a lot of the capacity concepts are in this new page that was just put up. So we would encourage you to take a look at that as well. Um, the capacity assessment tool was something we did. I know I'm out of time, but the capacity assessment tool was something we did a few years ago, where the analysis was done for every single small community system. Um, a survey was sent out. We asked these questions of the small systems based on that feedback and an analysis of our databases. We gave a score to all of the small community systems. Those are published. Those are also incorporated into the WOOCs. And this is a map of what we found in late 2015, 2016 um, for the capacity of small of the 330 small community systems in Connecticut. So based on a, a, an aggregate score of the technical capacity, financial capacity, and managerial capacity, an overall score yielded you either a red, yellow, or green. The red ones are the ones that are in most need of assistance, <coughs> excuse me, yellow sort of borderline, and the green systems would be ones that we would deem to be in pretty good shape. Uh, obviously, that may change. It's also interesting in this map that you can sort of see the de where the dense density of systems are. Uh, but this is sort of the, the state of capacity in Connecticut uh, for small community systems. The scores that led to that map are also online and they're in the work reports as well. But if you go to the capacity page, they're all listed there. And one tool we briefly wanted to touch on is uh, our drinking water state revolving loan fund program. We have worked very hard to try to make this an option for small systems. In some instances, uh, there's even subsidy available for, for small system programs, um, low interest rate loans. Uh, please contact us if you think that if you have some infrastructure work that you want to do in your small system, and we will certainly work with you to make sure that this is an, an option for you uh, for projects that you may have moving forward. And this is an SRF map that shows uh, where we've executed projects over the last few years. So this, most of the state has taken advantage um, of our DWSRF program. This is my contact information. If you have any questions, you want any information, you want to talk about the WOOCs, please email or call me. Uh, my direct line is 7341. You can call that number as well. And below that is our website address. And I only went two minutes over. Uh, thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Tom and Eric. Um, I'm just going to quickly, to get us closed out, um, ask one last poll question. That question is, are you interested in receiving technical assistance for your water system? If you would really like some help um, from someone like Tom, who knows what it's like to start a regionalization program and who's worked on them, you can let us know here and we can get in touch with you. Um, and then we can spare maybe just a minute or so for any other questions. So if you have a burning question and you would really like Tom or Eric to answer, please let us know here. And if we don't get to it, we can follow up with you offline. So I'm gonna go ahead and close this. We will get in touch with you if you responded. And um, I think we do have one question. Um, looks like it's for Eric. So Eric, um, the looks look great. Um, if you're someone at a system and you'd like to share that, who would you recommend sharing it to, either at a system or at a local government organization? Who should you sit down with? Cass, I'm sorry, could you repeat that one more time? Yeah, what kind of, how would you, who would you suggest um, sharing the WOOC information with at a system? Um, it's someone who is not sure about whether they should take it to their board or whether it might be more appropriate to um, talk to um, just other operators first or what, what they should do with this information. Yeah, I mean, there's so much to it. I guess it would depend on what part of the reports they were interested in. I would hope, I mean, what we're trying to do now that we've gotten the reports, uh, the coordinated plans approved is hopefully, and I know there's a lot of content to it, but hopefully, especially with the small systems, that they're becoming familiar with at least the portions of the coordinated plans that apply to them. And hopefully there are findings and recommendations in there that would apply to them. And then if there are things that they latch onto or things that they think might help them, then you know that's a great time then to go to your municipality, go to a WOOC meeting or come to us and say, look at, I found this in the WOOC. These are a couple of great ideas. How can you help me along? So I think it would depend on the topic that they um, were looking at within the WOOC plans. And then we could talk about if, if it was 
appropriate to talk to your town planner or talk to your local health department, uh, talk to your ESA holder. Certainly everyone has an ESA uh, in, their, in their area now. Um, so it would depend and certainly we can help people that want to start a conversation. I mean, that's what we're here for. We're certainly happy to sort of broker, um, you know, introduce people to whoever they would need to talk to. Great. Okay. That's very comprehensive. Uh, thanks. Um, on that note, uh, Eric and Tom, um, time for some closing comments. I'll let Tom, you can go first and then Eric, maybe you want to close us out. Great. Thank, thank you, Tess. And, um, Thank you, Eric. Uh, I would, a couple things. I would add that I, I read the, uh, the uh, short form, I guess, uh, Wook reports, and um, they're worth reading. Um, if you're a water operator, they're posted online. Um, they're very interesting. I think it's a very uh, progressive approach to looking at the issue of systems across Connecticut. Um, the other thing is, is that start the conversation. Um, doesn't cost you anything. Like I said, maybe a cup of coffee. Start the conversation. Um, look, look around. Um, you're not the only one that's having the same problems. Uh, you know, every I talk to systems literally from Alaska to Hawaii to the East Coast. They all start off with, "You never heard this before." Guess what? We've heard it before. Um, share, share some of the love, and uh, and I think I think it'll be you'll uh, you and your uh, customers will appreciate it. Thanks again. Great, thanks. Uh, Eric? I would say please don't be afraid to come to a WOOC meeting. I think you'll find that a lot of your peers and people that you could have great conversations with, even offline, uh, would be there. We, we've sort of, unfortunately, community, small community systems were underrepresented, and we'd love to have more small communities come and hear about your stories and, and try to help you along. And thank you. Great, thanks everybody. Um, please get in touch if you have any other questions. Bye-bye now.